Hey, everybody. Welcome to Blah, Blah, Blah with Katie Sackoff. I am Katie Sackoff. And um, this week's guest is um, someone I've wanted to had, have on from the very, very, very beginning um, because he has inspired me in, in starting a podcast, actually. Um, and his honesty and authenticity are one of the things that I love that we always talk about on this show. So um, you guys know him. You love him. <laughs> I love him. He was my first on-screen kiss. Uh, Michael Rosenbaum. That's right. I was your first on-screen kiss. <laughs> the show, folks, was Zoe, Duncan, Jack, and Jane. Yes. And you I was Jack. Jack. And you and I made out. We did. In a scene. Did, there wasn't tongue, though, was there? I don't think so. Did you try? I don't recall. Did Probably you? Probably. I'm a decent fella I, I don't mean, I mean I've grown up a little bit so uh I don't think so I don't think you do tongue work in these sort of situations the uh, I, I remember making out with uh well making out I don't know if you're allowed to say making out with a, an actress you know for the show so it would is be that making not PC out see anymore to say well, making out are we well, like, not allowed you, you to can't say, say oh out? I made out with her you can't say that oh, like, you because can't brag it's about fake it it's a fake make it out. was Jack not you yeah, but I, yeah, yeah, yes. But I was talking about you know, on Smallville on with Kristen Crook. Yeah, we didn't. There was no tongue. It was just, it's weird too. Could you imagine having an open mouth kiss with no tongue? It's like oh. No, I've done it. Yeah, it's, have, it's like kind of awkward. I've done it. It's fun, comfortable. Let's be honest. Is it? So I am one of those people that I have learned the art of the half tongue. So the half tongue. Yes, please. Is. <laughs> I'll elaborate. The half tongue is you're not fully committed to the French kissing slash making out, but you are putting your tongue halfway into their mouth, just a little bit, right how where the, the teeth are. How do you do that? Yeah. How do you? It's a skill. Can, I, I can, can you on show me how your tongue would be if yeah. you're... So you practice with your hand, oh, if God. you will. All right. Okay. Been but like, there, done that. So... So take the bottom, like the knuckle, right. and give it just a little lick. But like not a full, just like a... Oh, it's kind of like a frog it. thing, isn't it's like it? A, it's like a... a little, little... Yeah, just like that. And you do that over and over and over again. So it looks like you're French kissing, and your tongue huh. is involved in the experience. Have you ever been turned on during a makeout scene? 100%. Have you? Yes. With me? I mean, that was a long time ago, but I'm, <laughs> I am I bank on it. You were 25 years younger. <laughs> I mean, we're going to, well, I was what? 25 years younger. Uh, I, yes, younger. Yeah. Uh, from this, yes. Yes, yeah. that's true. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, sometimes I don't enjoy it. If someone's breath's off or if the oh, chemistry's yeah. not great or you're not attracted to them, you really got to make believe. You got to pretend you time. Do you have a vivid memory in your head of a time where you were like, this is not where I want to be at all? Yes. Like you legitimately. You like during a makeout scene? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, I remember it. I remember this one moment. And it's like, I guess she had, you know, the, the woman had, um, it felt like a really uh, very healthy garden salad before the, the makeout scene. But it, it really, it, it just, it felt like something was, grow, like a plant was growing. Like, like almost, it was coming, like it was like it, it was very, the last of us, like she was yeah, blooming. Yeah, kind of last of us smell. Just really. And it was the last of me. It really was. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just remember, it's one of those things where you just, you don't really breathe. You just try not to. You're like. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I have to. <laughs> half tongue in that situation i would zero tongue um but you yeah. you mentioned how you didn't like you ate a bunch of food are you blooming right now last night you said you didn't have a good mm, i haven't really had anything to eat today i just brushed my teeth tongue flossed big flosser are you do yeah. you scrape your tongue huh do you scrape oh, your yeah. tongue I I scrape my with tongue. a metal one or a plastic plastic one, one. you really got to commit to the metal one yeah, but then it's you have to really changer. wash it a lot of really, you know, hot water because of bacteria. I, I get the ones you just throw away after. Oh, so you don't care about the environment at all. <laughs> oh, I care. I just don't care as much as you probably do. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I do care about the environment. I, I make a, a valiant effort to, um, you know, to put everything in the blue yeah. crates and the black ones. Sometimes the they get confused. The city doesn't recycle it anyway, so don't worry about it. What do you it. mean? Supposedly. I know you're into all that stuff, which is great. I, I should be more, you and Trisha still, right? I grew up in Oregon. Like it's yeah. like a, it's like you're no, born. No, I love it. You're born caring about the environment and recycling. But um, supposedly in the state of California, most of it doesn't get recycled anyway, the stuff that we put in the bin. So I think it's just, it makes us feel better, but yeah. it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually do anything. Do you know, I think in my life, if you added up all the times I've littered mm. and I'm 51 years old, mm. I'd say no more than 10 or 15 times in my life. Pur purposefully littered. Well, like threw a napkin out a window. Right. I'm not proud of it. Yeah. But I was young and stupid. And I might have done that. I don't re recall. Yeah. And sometimes I have a lollipop and the little sticks. So I'll just go. Bleep. Were you but, a that, but I don't I don't do that. I mean, like I said, 10 or 15 times in your life. Were you a smoker? I mean, I, uh, you know, I was also always like a so, sort of a social smoker, mm -hmm. but not till like really in my 30s. You know, you'd be on set and. You know, Big Al would be out there having a dart, and you're like, Al, you got an extra? Yeah, Rosie, come over here. And we talk about fly fishing and, you know, whatever. Because I littered a lot as a smoker. Okay, yes. Well, I, I, yeah, I guess you always flick the cigarettes out, but you someone do. on set usually cleans those up. But, we, they people, do. but people outside, I guess, they don't. That is littering, isn't it? It is littering. If a cop sees you throw a cigarette down, that's littering? I think so. And I think in the state of California, there are certain states where it's actually more of a problem because of fires that you can actually get like a pretty serious fine, I think. I think. Is that true? I don't know. I might have made it up. Wow. I might have made it up. But I try to be, you know, better to the environment. I try, you know, the only thing I do, I got to stop is bottled water. We all have to stop the bottled water. I think it's I know, such... they, they, well, why don't you make them stop selling it? They should, they should. It's because I think it's a, I think that bottled water is, it's one of those conveniences that we've gotten used to as a people that is completely unnecessary. Yeah completely unnecessary yeah. it's ridiculous it's so bad for the environment but back to zoe duncan jack and jane okay but i really you know I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get a water purifier downstairs <laughs> instead of giving my friends we have horror nights last night we had horror nights is that why you don't feel good i feel fine i'm just really like hung over from like uh i had a pot taffy what you mean also oh, like a pot chew yeah but they're not like they're they're really wonderfully uh manufactured um, <laughs> no, they're just, they're really tasty. And I have a friend that makes them, her sister makes them. And so we all take taffies and you get a little, you know, feeling good. And we eat a lot of junk food and watch horror movies every Tuesday night at my house. That sounds wonderful. It's a great time. Yeah. That it's really a great really, time. Really wonderful. Great group. We've watched hundreds and hundreds of movies. We have a ranking system, hmm. rating system. It's uh it's a blast. And most horror movies are not good. What, it, well, what did you watch last night? It was called El Conde. It sounded like Matthew McConaughey. El okay. Conde. It was a. Um, it was like a Spanish horror film about a vampire, and it was beautifully shot. And it was a story of like all these generations when he became a general and he did this and he did all these things, and he. But he's gotten to a point where he wants to die. He just is tired of life. So it's even though it's comical at times, it could be horrific at times. Mm. But it it just missed the amazing. Like it was almost amazing. It was good. Mm. But it wasn't amazing. And if they just did a little more, it could have been amazing. You are such a fan of film. You you are such a fan of movies, and yeah. you have the way that you talk about it. It was with such passion. When you were little, did you did you always have this passion for film, or is it something that you sort of got as you were older was were, was watching movies really big in your house when you were growing up you know yeah my mom she's a nut she's always been a nut <sighs> but she didn't have anybody to watch horror movies with her so as like a nine-year-old an eight-year-old she would have me watch these movies with her after school motel hell make them die slowly uh pet cemetery and I and this had a profound, you know, sort of effect on me. And I don't know what happened, but I had I started to love horror movies. But 
terrified at the same time as a little kid watching the shining at nine going, Oh my, what am I doing? You know, my nightmares and looking under my bed. I still like, I have an alarm system. I have two dogs. I have a bat. I have one of some other stuff, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's like, you know, spiked fences, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I want to be protected because I, I think it's because of the horror movies. But yeah. I've always loved them. I used to, I wasn't popular in high school, so I used to take my parents' VCR and I used to bring it up to my room with my VCR and I used to copy horror movies onto VHS. And you could fit on a blank VHS tape, you could fit three movies. So if I rented three movies, I would record them all onto one tape, and I had a huge collection. And that's what I did on Friday and Saturday nights. I never went to a dance, high school dance. I never had girlfriends. Hmm. Uh, I was the shortest kid in my high school. Really? Yeah, I didn't. I graduated at five four, and I grew eight inches my the next year and a half. But yeah, I. Uh, but I've always had an affinity for for horror movies, mostly horror movies, documentaries. I used to like movies more in general, Mm -hmm. but now I've kind of gravitated towards horror and documentaries because, well, there aren't a lot of great movies out there, let's be honest. No, there's not. Name a great comedy in the last year. Barbie. Okay, name another one. Yeah. Remember when you used to say, oh, yeah, Caddyshack, vacation, A hundred percent. But I also uh, have a two-year-old. So cartoons. I have not watched. Barbie's the only movie I've watched in the last year. I'm watching, you know. Like, I didn't see Barbie. I literally just watched it. Um, now, would you say if you hated it or say if you didn't like it? I would a hundred percent say if I hated it. Okay. And I would a hundred percent say if I felt in any way that there was like an, like a, like a, agenda to this movie at all and I don't feel like there was really because some people say there is no I don't think there was people I, always want agenda of course they do it's the it's the it's the it's the it's that trigger word that we have right now right but like I feel like um there is a wonderful monologue that you can look it up that America Ferreira says in the movie and it perfectly describes what I feel like oh. being a woman wow yeah. it was amazing well that's really great amazing. I love that yeah, I um it's great I know people, I'm just such a, what's the word when you're just like, I don't want to watch that. Mm. I don't, you know. uh, Contrary? It's not contrary. What's the word? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm a contrarian. Yeah. Sounds too, like yeah. you don't want to do anything. Does that come from well, I don't, like in when you were younger and like not feeling like you were included? And so you're sort oh, of like, I don't yeah. want to do what other people do. Yeah, probably. I wasn't. Yeah, it was. But I think it's just like there's certain movies I could just tell what this movie is. Mm. Like it has politically whatever. I, I I'm not even saying that. It's just like I wouldn't watch GI Joe uh, as a, as a guy. I won't watch Fast and Furious movies. They just do not appeal to me. Well, I wouldn't watch that. Guys either. with a bunch of testosterone and you know you know it, that's just not. I I don't gravitate towards. I got to see fast cars and mm. guys kicking each other's asses all over the place. I've never been that guy. Never. I mean, sure, I liked Rambo when I was a kid, but I was a kid. Yeah. You know, but like these movies now, I just kind of. I don't know. I mean, you'd be astonished by some of the movies that I'm just like, all right. Even like Born Identities, great movies. I saw the first one and it was great, right? But it's just like you just beating the shit out of somebody for 20 minutes. I don't disagree. I just I don't I just get tired of that. I'd rather I don't try I, I get an adrenaline from being scared. Yeah. If it's a good scare, it's like riding a roller coaster at at Magic Mountain. Yeah. And I like that or I like to be educated, hence documentaries. Yeah. So is, uh, is, is your mother still with us? Yes. Do, she's she, with us, but she's not really with us. She's not really. It's okay. My mom, it's fine. I had no, a 10 no. minute conversation last night with my mother about, um, where her emails were in her phone. Um, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, she's fine. with us, but she's not with us. So does your mom, do you guys still share that love of like horror film? Yeah, we do. She'll say, did you see that new exorcist? And this was years ago, so it wasn't this new exercise. The new one. Which <laughs> There's I, like I, 10 I, of them. I'm not even, I don't want to get into that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, she will, see, and I'll usually give it a shot. I'll listen to her. Mm. Sometimes I'm like, this was fucking terrible. And sometimes I'm like, hey, you know what? That was, that was a good one. Hmm. You know? I'm really picky, like I said. I mean, but I could tell you right now, I can probably name 10, 15 horror movies that you should see. And you will thank me because you didn't waste your time going through the bullshit through Shudder 
through okay. all. Okay. So what horror movie have you seen recently that you would suggest? Well, El Conde. The one I just With told you. The one you just watched about um, the vampire guy in Spanish. Uh, I would say Watcher. Not The Watcher, but Watcher on, I think it's a That's Netflix. That's a Netflix, right? It's about a girl who sees someone across the way staring yeah. at her. Yeah. Really good. Okay. Um, speak No Evil. Stay With It. Holy shit ending. Okay. Um, I yeah. don't like to be Okay. Scared. Well, then you're not going to like these movies. You, you just forget what I just told you. Yeah. I don't like to be yeah. scared. Um, it's not It's not my funnest thing. I feel like the world is scary enough. So I yeah. am not a big you're fan. Right. Yeah. What? Um, okay. So, so your mom gives you this love of horror films. Does that transition into you wanting to be an actor? Did that ever cross your mind when you were watching horror films with your mom? Like, oh, this could be cool. Like, did you have that understanding? I think I was just so at like out there as a kid. I, I just, I don't think my mind was always racing. You know, I, I, I a lot of people use the word ADD. I was going to ask you if you have ADHD. But I, I mean, anybody who knows me, anybody, any doctor I've been to, there was, I mean, I, I certainly have ADD. Yeah. And I took medication right before this interview. So, did you? Yeah. What do you take? It's called Dexa, Dexa, Dexa Trim? Dexa something. Dexa something. Um, and I only take it when I need to focus. Does it really help you? A hundred percent. How many milligrams? I don't know any of that. It's all very new to me. It's okay, all very new. All right. I'll show you when we're done. But it's in my uh, purse. It, it was just um So your doctors, everyone knows that you've got ADD or ADHD. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, it's it's just obvious. It's hard for me to But like you, when I put the headphones on, like I take something every morning too. Mm -hmm. But I um not Adderall. Yeah. That stuff fucking does not. I mean, no, I, it's not that good. can drive you crazy. I won't ever do that. But um and things are right for different people. Of course. That might be great for yeah, someone yeah, yeah, where it's absolutely. not great. Absolutely. But I uh, put my headphones on. And when I put those headphones on, it's like I'm transported into another dimension. I'm just focused on you. Okay. It's amazing how my attention can be so all over the place. But this podcast kind of, uh, it makes me more focused. And I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in people. And so, but growing up, I think my mom did repertory theater and my grandmother once sang at the Apollo, but you know, it was definitely her side. My dad was a real introvert and, you know, got embarrassed easily and had kind of a temper and, and my mom was all over the place. So I think I probably got the theater gene from her. I mean, I definitely got that from her. What kind of a kid were you if you've got these, these two parents that are so juxtaposed? <laughs> Well, I guess to get deep, folks, we're going to go deep. We're going, <laughs> we're going to go deep. We're going to go in, that? we're going <laughs> to inside <laughs> of Michael Rosenbaum on blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's not. You know, I'm pretty open for the most part. That's going to get me arrested. Um, but there's no children in the vicinity. You'll be yeah, fine. there's no children oh. here. We're good. We're good. Um, I, no one paid attention to me. And, I'm, and that's just not a sob story. That's just my brother actually validated me once by saying he was writing about our family. And he goes, and then there was Michael. No one listened to him or paid any attention to him. It was like he wasn't there. And I go, and I got a little emotional. Mm. And I wasn't emotional because of not being paid attention to. I was emotional because someone actually validated saw it. Saw it. And saw it. And um I used to get that validation from other families. So I'd stay at my friend Danny Cutter's for a few days or David Eidelman's house. And his mom would be like, aren't you, you've been here for three or four days, Michael. Shouldn't you check in with your does mom? It, she does don't your family care. miss you? Yeah, yeah. I just became the surrogate or whatever, you know, they became my surrogate families. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, um, so I just felt like I, and not being me sort of when I went into acting was it, it it helped at least be accepted in some way. I was like, oh, they're mm -hmm. accepting me. At least they're accepting me because I'm good at this. Or, you know what I mean? What what was it about, were your parents just really busy? Was What was it that made you seem overlooked? Well, I mean, look. <laughs> well, we can get into this. <laughs> Um, you know, my dad worked, I mean, he worked hard. He was a yeah. hard worker and I respect him for that for sure. Um, but he was gone from six to, you know, 
five thirty or six mm-hmm. every day. You know, I'd see him sometimes at dinner, and that was it. Um, but you know, uh, my mom was sort of all over the place. She, she wasn't. I don't think she. This isn't a to knock her. She just. I don't think should have had kids. Mm. She she always wanted to be the center of attention. Uh-huh. She always wanted that. So I think if she didn't have kids, she probably would have been better off. She would have been happier. And but I think you know having kids. I think you know there was some love, I guess. But I think that it hindered her from being the most or best she can be, maybe in her mind. So I don't think it was. You know, I always say if you're going to have kids, make sure they're the center of attention. If you're going to have kids and you still want to be the, I'm doing this and I'm going out, fuck off. Yep. Because that's not fair. Yep. And so I think a lot of us felt that. My brother was the youngest, so he he probably got the most attention for Just sure. Just two of you? Well, my mom had two kids before we were in the picture. And then she got divorced, married my dad. He was 18 and she was 23 with now a five and a six-year-old. Wow. Married her, had me a year later. And then had my brother five years later. Wow. That's a lot of that's a lot of things to pay attention to if you want to be the center of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just Yeah, it's tough. It's like you really have to and at a young age, I think it's important where I didn't I feel like, like I didn't get this sort of stuff was and this isn't like I forgive my parents. Mm. I, I have let go. I we all do the best we can, and you know, it's not me sitting here complaining. But I feel like um, in the developmental stages of a child, you have a little Mm two-year-old. And the real early years are so important, especially five, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like right around that time to feel safe, to feel unconditional love, to feel like they're smart, like they're doing things right. I think those are so important and I just don't remember getting that. Hmm. And I think that's really, so what I did was use acting as a tool to sort of like get attention, get love, which isn't real. It's, it's ephemeral Hmm. and it, you know, so I think that's, that's what we do. We want attention. We want to know we did well and that, you know, but, uh, you have to you have to do that on your own. You have to work on your own to get that feeling because it's like you know it's like uh, it just it goes away fast. That 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 sort of validation stuff. It's not equal to real love. It might feel like it, mm. but like you need to separate those two. Yeah. No, I mean I I definitely identify with that in the sense that you know my dad worked a lot as well, and and my way of getting attention was to succeed at everything. Because that was hundred uh, percent was the attention. My my brother got in a lot of trouble, and so it was like, well, I can't get in trouble because he's he's got that ace in the hole. So I got to do something else. So I'm just gonna win at everything. And I picked the hardest career I could think of to succeed in, and said, if I could do this, I'm worthy of love. Like that was a hundred percent. If I look back on it That's now, dangerous. Yeah. Super dangerous, super dangerous. A lot of therapy to yeah. get over that. But like, so did you get it? Was he like, I love you. I'm so proud of you. You're, you're terrific. They were always that way. My parents were always, really? there, always appreciative, always like? like, no, they were amazing. And even, so it wasn't more so when I succeeded at this, I think the shock and awe of succeeding at this came out of them but my parents were always there I think for me it was the moment when I decided I didn't want to do something to still get that validation and that love from them like if I was to quit acting today they wouldn't care they wouldn't care and that was the validation I needed I needed the validation of like if I'm just here existing am I enough and that took a long time for me to feel it's it's something that you um it happened for too long with me Mm. like it happened for too many years of just trying to prove myself to not just my parents or my dad or but to everybody i'm not just the little shit that nobody cared about or nobody knew or gave you know listened to or i'm i'm better than that i'm smart i'm funny i'm successful 
it's like proving yourself, but you know, you do it for too long and you realize, hopefully, what are you doing this for? What do I have now decided in my life to do what I love? Even if, you know, a lot of people out there do what they don't love Mm. and they have to, to make money for their families. And I truly respect that. But I do think that everybody not only deserves, but also has the chance to do something else that gives them purpose. Anything on the side that you like, playing guitar, um, doing art, learning how to do art, having a passion, having a purpose, whatever, find, you know, it's, it's important. Well, having a passion, that's, yeah. that's, that's important. And so for me now, I don't do things and go, dad's going to really love this. I, I don't care at all. Yeah. I just want the show to do well and be authentic and vulnerable and whatever I do, I want there to be an element of fun. Mm-hmm. I have a, a children's book I'm doing that's coming out and it's fun. Yeah. And I'm doing this other project and I'm like enjoying it. I'm not thinking, well, what if uh, it doesn't work out? And what if it doesn't, you know, I'm thinking, don't think of all that stuff. That's anxiety. Yeah. You're right here in the moment. Are you enjoying the ride? Yeah. If we could just enjoy the ride. And so I'm not, I don't care about as much. I mean, look, I had a show and the thought was it's a live show downtown Regent theater. No one's going to show up in my head. Oh my gosh. What if like 20 people are there? And my friend's like, then fucking do it for 20 people that, that love you and are there and want to see your show. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's still that part of me that's like ego or it's like, Oh, no one cares. No one, you know, and I got to get over that. That's something that I just got to get over and just go, Hey, have fun. Your friends will show up and hopefully some people who like the podcast show up. Yeah. And we've sold some a lot of tickets. And so I know that that wasn't the case. Yeah. But I always put so much pressure on myself to like, like, what is that? Is that ego? Like your ego is going to be crushed because no one showed up? Sure. Of course it That's is. That's ego. Of course it is. Yeah. Did you, when you got into acting and you started succeeding at acting, did that fulfill that piece of you that you felt like you didn't get from your parents? Like, did it actually work to a certain extent? It worked because I, I would get attention and people, you know, the instant gratification of applause in a yeah. theater. And, um, you know, especially when you started doing TV shows and movies and, you know, big executives coming up to you at parties and you think it's real. You think it's, it feels so, you feel so alive and like, oh my gosh, it's so good to be loved and liked. But then you realize that's not what's important. It's fulfillment. It's how do you feel about what you did? How do you feel about um, what you're doing in your life, the person you are? And um, to me, that's when you just t- stop a beat and, and listen to somebody who just wants to talk to you for a second. Mm. Or, you know, there's this woman I just met at a con last weekend. And I don't know, but I sometimes I just sort of gravitate towards people. And this guy, Wayne and Janet, middle-aged folks, probably, you know, late 60s. Salt Lake City? Nope. DC. Okay. And I just talked to them for a bit. And then they came back the next day and she's like, oh, you're so nice. And thanks for taking us aside. And you just blah, blah. And went on. And I go, well, Wayne's going to take care of you here. You know, you can get anything you want at this con. So Wayne, take her shopping. And he goes, she goes, yep, that's right. He can, I can get anything I want. And she goes, I have terminal cancer. And I don't know what happened, but it just punched me in the heart. You know, my heart's over here. Yeah. And I just got emotional and I hugged her and I hugged Wayne and I said, what? And, you know, we talked and I, I had a line of people to sign on and I stopped. I said, I need to take this moment. And um, I looked at Wayne. I go, Wayne, I'm giving you my email and I swear to God, if you don't email me, I'm going to kick your ass. And I want you to keep me up to date on how Janet's doing. And so he already sent me an email and... Uh, it's just like I look at her and she's so full of life and I love their relationship and I can see them having a beer and just sitting in their rockers and hanging out watching TV, mm-hmm. whatever. 
I could just visualize their happy life together. They look so happy. And then you see that. And we hear it all the time. Life is so short. We have to, but we, I mean, how many clues are you going to get before it, you know, gets smacked into your face? So you look at that and you're just like, oh man. It's a, uh, it's an interesting thing when life hands you a moment that whether it be someone that you come in contact with or somebody, something happens in your own life that stops you dead in your tracks and makes you think to yourself, it truly could be over at any minute, any minute. Yeah. And that, that joy that you talk about is truly what life is about. It's, it's about feeling joy, making connections and feeling every emotion that this life has to offer because that's mm. truly living. Yep. It's truly living. hundred percent. I think yeah. that it's, you know, I'm a bit of a homebody. I, you know, I like to sit in my screening room and just kind of watch movies and have friends over and, you know, I'm not a big, let's go out and hike the stairs in Santa Monica. Let's, uh, Let's uh, parasail. Uh, hey, it's a glorious day for a six-mile hike. You know what? Fuck you. I'm I, a, I, yeah, I, I mean, I get both of those. I get them too. I but get like, both of those. You know, girl, it's so funny because I'm on these dating apps, and one girl, one woman says uh, just that. She goes, if I like being outdoors, mm. so if you don't, you know, don't hit me up. And it was like, I like intellectual conversations. And I'm like, see you later. Like you were like, I you like, want me to go on a hike and talk about. I mean, you know, like first Freud of all, you just, done. this is why you're on a dating app. Right. Not that I'm, I'm on it too, but I'm kind of transparent. Like, you know, I'm like, Hey, uh, what is your app? What is your, what uh, is your thing? Shit say? With the door open. I, no, I don't, I don't have that. I don't Does it really it. say no, shit with the door open? No, it doesn't say shit with the door open. Because shitting with the door open, that's like, like year three of marriage. No, no. I do, The only time I do that is when my friends are over the house, just so I can hear my friend Rob go, dude, close the door. No one wants to see that. I go, you don't have to look. I'm just, I don't want to miss anything. Is this, do you think that? This, it's immature, like I know. Do you think that these are moments <laughs> that you go, huh? No, like, I, I maybe think... I'm. This is this is like you know, like if you do that with a woman on a date, Michael, I would never do that with a woman. What I'm saying is, but no, with a guy, with the guys, when it's just me and a couple of my closest friends of 20 years, <laughs> I will shit with the door open, and you know what? I will mark that as a great memory in my life. As you're And it makes like, me smile and it makes me smile <laughs> that they're yelling at me in a kind of a funny way. To me, that is life. I wonder if they I come love over laughing. and know that you're gonna shit with the door open. They it's just, know it's that it's just at so this funny because Rob's so he's like, we're trying to do a, a live performance. Um we do stage it's every month, yeah. my band Sunspin. And you know, he's trying to work out the ca the camera and the whatever, and then he's just like, I go, Hey, uh Rob. He's like, Yeah, what, dude? I'm trying to do this. He's like, is this yours? Not. And he'll just look over and go, what? Come on, man. And just his face, just it, it makes me so happy to see him so annoyed with me. I don't know what that is. That's got to be like, maybe it's because, you know, my dad used to, I think, you know, when my dad used to get really mad, I was a real smart ass. I was quick. So if he said something, I would, you know, I'd probably get smacked for it. But like, I would go right back at him. Did you like... Like your dad says these things to you. Did you create sings this? To me. No, says these things oh, to you. Oh, I was like, my dad didn't sing to me. But do you? <laughs> did you? It's like Jesus, what are you talking about? <laughs> talking about blah blah blah. No, this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm like, your dad says these things to you. Quick, this this person that you were when you were younger. Did like who you are now? Was this curated by you or were you always this I, I, kid that was like I was this always this kid who just, you know, wanted attention, wanted to just have fun, wanted to make everybody laugh, didn't want to take things too seriously. Um, and then you grow up and you're forced to take some things seriously, but it doesn't mean you have to stop being fun and, you know, doing the things you love. And I have a great group of friends that have been my friends for a long, long time. I don't go through friends yeah. like a lot of these people do in Hollywood. Like, Oh yeah, here's my best friend, Janice. I've known her a month. And yeah. you know, 
yeah. I, I, I don't do that. It, it takes me a while. I, I don't have, I mean, I, I have a lot of celebrity friends, but I don't hang out with them mm. a lot. I mostly have a core group of people that, um, we do fun things. We're going to see Billy Idol in Vegas. I like to do okay. fun, goofy things, you know? And, um, do you think that, do you think that women, as we get older, take ourselves too seriously? No, but uh, I think what I was going to say to your point is I look like I do in my life for an element of fun. Mm. If a woman is too serious all the time, if she's doesn't have a play, playful sort of way, um, if she questions everything and doesn't like let things just go and happen, if everything's not, if it's not easy, things should be easy. I agree. My friend Tom once said, he goes, you really want to be in a relationship? I go, yeah, I, I, I do. I've been in relationships before, not long ones, but yeah. And he goes, well, just know that when you're in a relationship, her problems now become your problems. Mm. So now, so you want to date someone who has minimal problems. <laughs> obviously. So when obviously, I look at that, like you don't obviously. want, you don't want, um, yeah, there's just certain things that y you want to, you want it to be easy. Um, have you ever been married? No, I haven't no. been married. Have you ever been close? I mean, I think there's a couple that we talked about it maybe, yeah. but, but no. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that stems from, you know, childhood and, and set in my own ways a lot of times. And, um, I'm, I'm picky. I am picky. I, I just, it has to feel right. It just has to feel right for well, me. Well, the older you I'm, get, yeah. the, the, the pickier you, sh you most people get, you know, we, because we become set in our ways, we don't want to change the older we get. And then you meet someone who is also set in their ways and doesn't want to change. And, and it's just finding a person that you can bend with. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, I try to go out with women who can go with the flow and also stand their ground and be like, you know, like, all right, get off your fucking lazy ass. We're going out to dinner. I found this cool place. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's go. I like when people like don't go. So what are we doing all the time? Yeah. It's like, well, if you're asking me, we're doing nothing. Yeah. I mean, I'll do things you're like, like I we're like sitting to, here watching movies. I like to go to concerts. I will take you to a lot of concerts. We'll go out to dinner. We might go to the Magic Castle. You know, we'll do fun things. But I also like a couple of nights with the boys, play hockey. You know, I'm not. And I'm not one that's good. Maybe I meet the right woman. Maybe I throw it all away. And I just go, oh, my God. Princess Leia from Jedi. <laughs> you are, you know. You might. But you you know what, though? I, I believe that it should be easy as well. I, I truly believe that when you meet the right person, of course you're going to have problems. Of course you're going to have arguments. But it should never be hard in the beginning. Right. I have friends that have been dating people for three months. And they're like, oh, it's just so hard. I'm like, oh, then you should be done. Out. You got to get out. It shouldn't get hard until you get married. Until you got kids. Kids make shit hard. Yeah. Terminal illness makes things yes. hard. Medical bills. Losing parents makes things hard. Dating shouldn't be hard. No, it should be fun. I always say this. I always say, I've said this before, but 99% of the time it doesn't work out. Yeah. So the 1% of the time it does work out that you end up married and 50% of that works out. So instead of thinking about the half percent chance that this is going to work out on our coffee date or our dinner, let's just have a good time and enjoy it and not think too much. And if it starts to develop into something great, but sometimes people just have to have, this is what are you looking for? What do you want? I don't want kids. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I, you know. <laughs> do you want kids? Um, you know, I don't think so at this point. I'm too yeah. old for fucking kids, man. I, I, I'm 51, man. I could barely pick up my underwear to pull it up to my waist. <laughs> you know. Trust me. 43 I'm with like honest. a toddler is not fun. You know when you're picking your underwear up with your toes and throwing them at yourself and catching it. Yeah. You know, I've used salad you know, tongs before. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not bending over today. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not doing it. I, <laughs> I've had these things, um, but 
What did you say? <laughs> I forgot. I said, do you want kids? Oh, yeah. You went off of that. No, I, I don't think so. Um, unless I say I don't think so because it's 95% sure. Mm. But if I suddenly meet someone. Yeah. That everything's just going so smoothly and she'd be a terrific mother and she was like, listen, I just want to be a, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. If it just happened to work, stay at home mom and I, I want to just, you know, raise kid. I just want to, you know, I mean, you don't have to do anything. I mean, not anything, but I'll, you know, I'll change diapers and not do all the shit that is necessary. Yeah. And I'll love the kid like no one's ever loved a kid. But, you know, if she's in it for at least 50 percent or more. With the That's help, what it should be. then I might go. Oh, you know what? I love the crap out of you. All right, if you want to do this, let's do it. Let's do it right. It's good to have an open mind. I love that you still have an open mind. I do. That you're not I, rigid in that. I don't want to get anybody pregnant. No. That would no. be just disastrous. No, there's That's too many not... people fighting over kids already. Gosh, LA is just a smorgasbord of it like. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it's one of the reasons we left. It's one of the reasons we left LA. It was just it just was getting. It just too much. It was too much. Too many people. Too minute. Too much drama. Too much. Just not focused on what life is really about. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's for us. For us, I'm not making a statement on no. everyone in LA, but for no. us, it just was was time. So it's tough. It's a tough city. It's yeah. like you know, it is. It's as great as it is. There's so many great things. You can go on and on. 100%. The weather, the the sports, the restaurants, the beach, the the go to Ojai, it's an hour away. Go to Palm Springs. I mean, there's there's so many things. I don't to think do. there's many places that are better. Uh, but it depends. Look, it's very expensive to live here. Yep. Um, I think you're happiest no matter where you are. As long as you have the people you love and want to be around with you. True. If you have that, you will be happy. Yeah. And if you love yourself, you're not going to, you're just chasing after things. Maybe this will make me happy. It's the same thing. Yeah. Maybe if I move here and I, I, you know, I've thought about that stuff and I'm like, is that going to make you happy? Really? Is that what it is? Well, you know, I think in our industry, we have the, we have this sort of luxury of moving around a lot because of our work. Yeah. So I think that we know that. I think that that a lot of people, especially like actors that like that were on long running series for a long time, when you lived in another place for a long time, I think you know, oh, my family's here, my friends are here, my life is there. Mm -hmm. Like when when I was in Vancouver, I always felt pulled to come back to LA because I didn't have a support system in Vancouver when I was there. Yeah. Yeah. I think support systems are huge. And you know, my mom's always been in Indiana and my sister mm. and my brother lives in Rhode Island and my dad's kind of touring the world right now, I guess midlife crisis or whatever, but he's, he's living it, he's doing it. And my grandma lives in Florida and my uncles are all scattered over the East coast. So the only time we see each other is my grandma's 95th birthday, you know, but most of the family's so broken up and it's been difficult because I have to be the one that comes out to see everyone yeah. and they don't see a lot of them don't see each other they're not on great terms so i have yeah. to do and i'm like you know it's very hard and but my friends have become my family i mean thanksgiving is all my friends i never have family members an occasional uncle will come but yeah. like you know it's just and and we used to be our family used to be so tight every holiday we'd go to new york and everyone would be together at my grandma's house and those days are long gone long gone why because ultimately people don't get along people stop being in touch with other people um and i don't think people are that nice to each other yeah some some are but some aren't and you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to be around some of my family. It's just, mm -hmm. it's work and it's stress. Yeah. Like I get that anxiety like, uh, cause I'm my, my dad and his brothers don't really get along that well. I mean, it just, so it's kind of uncomfortable to be around sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I get that. It's just weird. It's just weird. It's like, and it, yeah. So like mm -hmm. I said, it's, it, it's, it's my, my core group of friends. Is, yeah. It, that's just, they're my life. When you were in Vancouver shooting, because you did the f seven seasons of Smallville. So you were there for seven. eight years y off and on. Yep. Because of the pilot, right? So sort of, I guess, like yep. over eight years. 
Did you come back and forth to Los Angeles a lot? Yeah, I think by the fifth, sixth, seventh seasons, I would, if they said you're working Tuesday and Thursday, I'd fly in Monday night, I'd leave Thursday right after work, mm -hmm. and they go, you're working, my I mean, as long as I had two nights in my own bed, I would do it. If I didn't, I'd stay in Vancouver at a place. Yeah. Did you ever think you would stay in Vancouver and like commit to that? Or did you always sort of, cause I had worked with people that like really loved Vancouver and were like, I'm here. And then like myself, like you yeah. got out as fast as I could. I never felt in love with it. I just felt like it was always cold and I was bald. It was raining. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, and I associated it with work yeah. when I was in LA and I landed, I'm like, playtime. See my friends, hang out. I could just, you know, forget about what I'm doing right now and then focus on the work. Yeah. So it's kind of helpful. But for the first two years, I think I mostly did live in Vancouver. I had a houseboat, which was a lot of fun. Oh, shit. I remember on that. On Granville Island. Yes. Freaking phenomenal. So, um, yeah, I made the most of it. But, you know, Vancouver is beautiful, but I think it's beautiful a couple months a year. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not beautiful all the time. No, it it's rains the, a lot. Yeah, I, I it just, rains a the lot. The rain is just no. I get it. Trust too me, much. you just moved to Portland. I'm, I get it. it yeah, right. Fact, does it, it make does it depress you? A little bit, a little bit. But um, but I I there's a part I, of I, me, I, I, no, there's I, a part I, of you know. me that <laughs> feels more alive when it's raining. Because I feel like it forces me to, I'm more conscious of, of like, I'm more in the moment. Forces really? me to be more in the moment when it's raining, yeah. It's very, it's very strange. Maybe because I'm from there. You know, I'm from Portland, so I grew up like that. But, yeah. you know, I need seasons to mm -hmm. remember moments. Like in Los Angeles. There's no seasons. There's no seasons. So how do you know what year it was? Like, I forget. I'm like, wait, it was sunny. Was that Christmas? Shit, I don't remember. Mm. It was warm. I always remember going uh, somewhere for Christmas, like always going to Big Bear where there's snow. Mm -hmm. Where there's snow. So I could always remember those yeah. for the most part. Um, but you're right. You're right. That's, um, I do miss those seasons. Yeah. You know, Indiana was kind of cool, the winter. And I remember so many good times as a kid playing with my friends and, the, and Halloween. And yeah. The fall was awesome, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. yeah, you don't, you don't, that is one thing. Yeah. That's a major thing that, that kind of blends here. together that you don't get here. Yeah. Did, so, and I know you've talked about this, like leaving after season seven was, did you get a lot of shit about that or did <laughs> sure. you feel supported in no. the decision? I think, um, you know, my contract was six years and I, I ended up doing seven. So I was, um. And it was funny because Peter Roth, who I never really thought was that cool, mm -hmm. um, he was the president. And, uh, you know, I just felt like it's kind of full of it. And to be honest with you, always handing out hugs and loving on everybody and and shitting on you behind the camp, behind the scenes. Listen, I sat down and <laughs> I, I begged him to do more Longmire. Um, we begged and he wouldn't do it. Yeah. So, well, you know, he is. Uh, he had a, um, this will get you some, uh, <laughs> some downloads. <laughs> Zoom in on camera no, too, please. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm kidding. I know. No, but honestly, um, when we were re renegotiating mm. and I just thought they were being incredibly unfair, not even reasonable at all. And they weren't, it was just like, you know. You know, it's just like wherever you work in the world, you deserve what you deserve. And you know, if like you're an integral part of something, you should you, you deserve be some validated in that. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like you know, it's. Like, but anyway, it got to the point in the negotiations where Peter supposedly marched into the creator's room and uh, said, "You fire him! Fire him now! Just fire him!" And they looked at him and we go, "We can't. He's fucking Lex Luthor." And God, I wish I knew that then, because I would have really negotiated, to, you know. No, but like, um, it was, I remember that. And then when uh, I left after season seven, I was, it was very good terms. I was, I thought I was like, I always worked very hard. Yeah. I, I remember um, 
Peter Roth wants to have dinner with you. I was like, Jesus. And he didn't know that I knew that he, you know, about the firing mm-hmm. thing at that time, because that would happen earlier. But I did know. And he sat with me, and it was like the first time he'd ever met me. And I had done a series that lasted two seasons for him, and a show that lasted two seasons, um, pilots that I did favors for to do, and seven years on Smallville. I probably worked more than any other actor on that network in the double dubba dubba dubba's history wb or yeah and look they have a new regime now and i'm so glad that's why i feel i feel free like talking about peter's not there anymore yeah because now they got awesome people over there and they're it's incredible but um he sat me down and he's just like you got to come back you have to do these three years we want to shine you for a three-year deal You, you know and just went on and on and What's, why don't you want to go, oh, I just, um, I love doing comedy. I just want to go direct a little movie that, you know, I wrote and mm. just have fun and, you know, start to explore and do stuff. I, I, I did this character for seven years, 163 it's a episodes. Long time it was to a lot, 10 months a, a year. And I just was like, hey, you know. And then I, I said, you know what? Well, Peter, you guys sent an offer. Just send an offer, but I'm probably not going to do this. You know what the offer was? The same money I was getting. Are you serious? On my mother's life, my mother's life. It was life, literally it the was same offer. It was the same offer. So whatever I was making when I left, they go, yeah, so sign on for three years and you'll get the same the thing. The same thing. No. Hey, work at Arby's for another three years, but yeah. we're not giving you a raise, but we really like you. Yeah. Oh, do you? So no. I was just like what and my agent was like well hang on let's counter i'm like no. counter what why counter when that's you've just, been so that, that was the last straw for me yeah that was it i just said i don't want to counter i don't care what they offer now it's principal done don't care good for you and that was it i respect that yeah fully and i knew i had to respect myself yeah and it was like it wasn't worth it i was like hey i'm okay i'm okay i worked i have a little cash i got a great life Let's go do it. Let's go do something else. Did did working on that show start to take the joy out of acting? And not meaning the show, yeah. just the time, the amount of time playing one character. Sure. I mean, I get bored pretty easily, and you know that's a commitment. Yeah. And um, I always committed to the character, always. But yeah whenever they said cut i was the guy making jokes and doing stand-up and doing impressions and you know because i had to yeah and i could fool around up till action and i'm just i just jump into it that's just how i've always worked i don't need to unless i have a big speech or something and i need to really focus or something but you know for the most part that's how i stay in it by doing by being distracted until i need to really be on but um yeah playing the same part and um for that long, it was it was tough, and I just knew I had so much else to offer. But I also respected the role, and I thought, you know, because people have <clears throat> a tendency to say, you know, about roles you do, and it's like, you know, well, he's known it mostly as Lex Luthor, and that's the role. And I'm like, fuck yeah, if I'm known for that, and that's the only thing in my life, that's not awesome. Yeah, I don't, I don't care. I really don't. I used to think like, oh, you know, I got to do something better. I've got to be better than that. God forbid you get pigeonholed or whatever. How are you going to be better than like playing a a great character like that on a great show for so many years? I mean, you know, just to be lucky enough to be on a great show and be good in something is, is, is amazing. So I honestly like that's how I'll be remembered. That's the the best thing ever. But you're arguably so many people believe that you are like, the best Lex <laughs> Luthor. Well, it's true. I, you know, I, look, I, I, Gene Hackman's always been my favorite. We're just two, it was two different roles. Was, yeah. And, but like, it was good to actually know, and this was something I worked on to actually look at yourself and not need all the, it's, it's great to hear like, you know, you know, like James Gunn said it on the podcast mm. and, you know, Stan Lee. And it was, it, it's really cool to see your, you know, your peers and people you respect and admire and your friends mm. say that. But the most important thing is you have to know it. You have to know that you were really good. And I look back now, especially doing this rewatch podcast with Tom Welling, yeah. which we do Talkville. I watch it and I could sort of appreciate like going, hey, 
You did a good job, man. This is you're good. You're good in this. Did James? Was there? He said it on the podcast. Yeah, he said it on the podcast. But what, is there? He's doing this new the, the new Superman. Yeah, he said. Is um, there a world where Lex no, no. like shows up and well, you're like? I, I said. He said to me. <laughs> did they have a multiverse in that? Well, James looked at me in the podcast and he goes, "Well, you're the best Lex Luthor." I go, come on. No, 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 no. You're the best. You're the best Lex Luthor ever. Period. I mean, come on. You know that, right? And I go, what? Uh, and I go, S but you're not going to cast me as Lex in your movie. He goes, no, no. <laughs> and we laughed. And, you know, they're, they're just going, he's going in a completely mm -hmm. different direction. I don't even know if there is a Lex Luthor in that. But yeah. um, I, don't, I don't care, really. I expect it out of this uh, in the industry. I expect that, you know, well, first of all, James is brilliant and he's, He's creating his own sort of universe and re uh, what's the word imagining reimagining the whole thing, and you know I hope it's brilliant and it probably will be. I hope so. When did you? How long have you known James? Um, I've known James over twenty years. It's a long time. How'd you meet? Um, we met at the premiere for Without a Paddle. I went to go see. My buddy Dax invited me mm -hmm. and his friend Seth Green and Matthew Lillard invited mm -hmm. him. And then I became friends with all those guys. But we met there. Then we saw each other on a plane. Then we started hanging out. And and that was it. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. This, uh, this industry is so filled with relationships of people that meet randomly that then end up in in these groups that follow, like James casts a lot of his friends a lot. Yeah. A lot of people that he respects that he's known for a long time. Yeah. yeah. He does. Yeah. Huh. So I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he does. Um, he does. He does. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And there's always a, there's always a, uh, I think that's that thing that people think about this industry that they think you're going to meet someone, become friends with them, and they're just going to put you in everything. Yeah, it's not that, that does not happen. It doesn't. Happen. I'm here to say that that does not happen. It that doesn't mean that they're not thinking of you, or that doesn't mean that it's just like they have a vision for their, you know, projects, and you know, sometimes it, it just doesn't fit in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, my goal is always to work with my friends. I, I you know, I did a little raunchy uh, comedy that I directed back in 2014, I think, called Back in the Day, and it was just back in Indiana and. I hired a lot of my friends. I yeah. hired a lot of my friends because. Well, you're working with with John right now on something, right? John. Not John. Oh, Heater. Yeah, John Heater. John Heater from Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He and I are doing. We're doing a, a reality show that I came up with and I pitched it, um, and it's it's uh, called Scared with okay. Michael Rosenbaum and John Heater, and we go where we love horror movies. Mm -hmm. He's part of the horror group, so we go to the scariest places on earth. And we just, it's like two goofballs, like, you know, going, is this really scary? This is pretty much the lamest thing ever. You, uh, <laughs> you know, John, I'm like, no, what, dude, this is cool. Like, we have such a, like, I'm like, he's like, come on, Rosenbaum, why are you such, you know, because he, does, he's, he's, he doesn't get tired. He always wants to explore and do things. I'm like, I'm going to freaking bed. He goes, you're a loser. <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's going to be really funny and fun. And also, if there's things that are scary, we will be the first to say it's scary. We're not going to hype it up. If this sucks, we're like, this is lame, man. The first time I met him, I, maybe the only time I met him was with you. And you guys together are very, very, very funny. Yeah, he's just, a, he's so fun to be around. He's yeah. like, we, <laughs> yeah, we just, we met at horror, uh, Universal Horror Nights years That's ago. That's where you met? Through my friend Kyle Newman. And um, then I started going to his movie nights. And then... He started coming to my movie nights because then he moved to he moved to Oregon. And he moved to Oregon yeah, too. I Does he, he still live in Oregon? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, he lives huh. in Oregon. I could be wrong. <laughs> I always FaceTime him, but it's in his house, so I can't tell where the fuck we are. But anyway, it's, there's the gloom. I mean, isn't all the there's same? There's a gloom Washington, to the FaceTimes with Oregon, by the way. Is there? Like, oh, I ugh. need lighting. Like, I gotta find a light when yeah. I'm FaceTiming people in Oregon. I wish I had this lighting. This is great light, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. It's really good light. Yeah, it's good light. Yeah, yeah. We're doing something right. Yeah, this is great. We're doing something blah, right. Blah, blah, blah. With... Can I be that, like, your announcer so you hear this over the screen? Like, you you do, like, a clips, like, for the opening. It's, like, clips of you and different um, actors. And you're the announcer? And, and there's music over it. And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. Well, go back to the wide shot. Can you put <laughs> some music on it all? 
Blah, Indiana. blah, blah with Katie Sackhoff. <laughs> brought to you by Boone's Farm and <laughs> Bartles and James <laughs> and Lexapro. Oh, my God. I wish that we were brought to you by anything other than just my bank account. Uh- <laughs> no, you will be. You, you, you'll get sponsors. Um. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, so, but you really were my inspiration to like want to do a podcast. Like, Aww. where did no? Where did you get the idea from your po- for your podcast? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be so transparent here. Um, this guy Rob, friend of mine, um, he now produces another friend's podcast. He says you should do a podcast, and I'm like, no, no, no. You got a good voice. You know people. You should do a podcast. I'm like, no, no. You no. do have a good voice. You have a radio voice. Well, thanks, radio ra- radio face. And then he goes, he goes, you'll make money. And I go, oh, what? That sounds all right. And we didn't fucking make any money. And we started doing it. And we had like, I'm telling you, 5,000, 6,000 listeners in the beginning. And we kept working things and working things. And then all of a sudden we had a little boost. And we, and then, you know, it started doing okay after years. And then he left to go do that other podcast because he can make more money, which he inevitably did. <laughs> and he, you know, we, I got another producer who, you, who honestly turned out to be a lifesaver. And he, his name is Bryce. And together we have really up the playing field. Like, you know, it's just, it, it, the show is, and I think why it became good is because I got vulnerable and real. And I just said, you know what? I want to talk about real shit too. I want to talk about anxiety and life that you're talking about. And I, I, I think that's important. I think that's what's important is, is, you know, destigmatizing um, mental health and um, all these things that go along with it and saying therapy is okay. It's yeah. actually good that you're in therapy. It's actually not normal that you're not in therapy. You know what I mean? I agree. So um, I think that's why I think I felt I, I I finally found a purpose. People were coming up to me saying, you saved my life. And I, I was like, what are you talking about? What was it that shifted? Like, did he inspire that shift or did you just sort of go? No, I just said, nothing's different. working. I, I think because I'm forcing it and, I, and I'm kind of trying too hard and I'm not really being that as genuine as I want to be. I said, fuck it. You know what? I get anxiety, guys. I, you know, I, I had an anxiety attack last night. It was the most, and then I just started opening up, and then people started opening up, and that's what it became. I think when I became more authentic and real, I think that's with everything. You, you know, if you, you know, it's you want to be around people that are genuine, you know. Um, yeah. And so when people are hanging out for an hour for the podcast, I think they're just like, hey. We're going to learn something about this person and maybe we'll learn something that will help us in our lives. Maybe there's a parallel. Maybe there's a similarity. Um, So I think that is, and it helps me. It's like therapy for me. When I talk to you for an hour, it's, you're helping me. You're helping people out there by just being honest. Well, I think that, that when you, when you, Michael, lead with authenticity, it disarms people. And I think that people feel uh, safe in that uh, he shared so I can share. And it does yeah. allow people to share, you know? Yeah. Because I think that I think that people are scared to be themselves for fear that they're going to be judged. My whole life was that. My whole life was scared to be myself, you know, um, which we've talked about today. And... It's amazing how finally, after all these years, I start actually, I stop pretending to be someone else or to be cool, and I just start being me, the real me. And we're still working on that. Yeah. And somehow it's working. Like, wait a minute. Being me is okay? Holy shit. Like, you guys are okay if I'm just talking about this kind of stuff and being real and there are people out there that are that really appreciate it and it's like wow i wish i would have known this moons ago well because that's that's what it is, no though, moon right? who said who's more foolish the fool or the fool who follows him obi-wan correct correct who said the sand people are easily startled but they'll be back and in greater numbers that's a trick question. It's Obi-Wan. Yes, correct. Who yeah. said, 
Look, you tell Jabba. That's Han Solo. Correct. No, you guys, I don't. So no. name four Jedi's from the oh, original in Empire Strikes Back that are standing there. Darth Vader. <sighs> no, there's no Jedi. Bosk, IG88, Boba Fett. Those are the Jedi. Lom four. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Thank you. Stop it. All right, but you know Mandalorian. I do a little. No, listen, I I didn't become an actor because I like was a fan of like award-winning cinematography and like, you know, movies that made people ponder their existence. I became an actor because I was on a fucking ET ride and got goosebumps and said, I want to make people feel that. And then I saw Die Hard and thought, I can do that. That was it. You can. That was, but that and was you it. Did. So I don't know movies. I don't know movies. No, you I don't, don't have know, to know movies. I don't know you, at you all. Know, you know, you're you're probably saving a lot of time. I get very intimidated though yeah. when people know a lot about film, as if I'm supposed to, as if it doesn't make me a good actor. No. If I don't know things. No, it probably makes you a better actor. The less you know, like. I'm probably better at podcasting because I don't listen to everybody else's podcast to kind of cheat and see what they're doing to make it better. I'm just doing what I believe in my gut and my, that's, you know, so maybe that helps. Do you like podcasting more than acting? Um, I like that. I could just improvise for an hour and enjoy it. And, uh, I, I took a break from acting except for doing guardians two and three and like another, a little movie, but, um, to write and kind of, see what I really wanted out of life. Mm -hmm. And now that uh, the juices are flowing again, I'm, I'm considering if it's the right project, if it's the right thing, then I'll consider it. But for a while there, I wasn't for a good four or five years. I just was like, I had, I just didn't, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to work 14, 15 hours a day on something that I didn't love. I didn't want to just be stressed out the ass and working in fucking, you know, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan for some series that no one gives a shit about. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something that I, I, that has potential to be successful and more importantly, give me purpose and feel like fulfill, fulfillment yeah. and go, I'm proud of this. Yeah. I don't care if really anybody says, as long as I'm proud of it, I'm like, this is good, man. Yeah. You know, so, Absolutely. but we'll see, we'll see what happens. It, it's, it takes a lot for me to want to be away from my kid. It's gotta be good. It's gotta be good. It's gotta be good. What's your favorite interview that you've ever done? This one right now. Fuck off. Blah, blah, blah with Katie Sackhoff. <laughs> brought to you by Gatorade. And remember that guy on Sports Center? That's how he talks. Brought to you by. Um, I wish we were brought to you I by. I haven't Gatorade. been on a lot of podcasts. No, I mean like on your show. Oh, guess. On inside of you. I don't know, man. That's hard. I mean, they're all good. You're great. Honestly, you are. Um, Zach Levi has been great. Uh, J.K. Simmons was great. Uh, Bob Odenkirk, Kiefer Sutherland. These guys, are, they're all great. Uh, Stephen Amell, um, Jennifer Love Hewitt. Uh, what makes a good guest? Someone who um, can put their ego aside and just have a genuine conversation and be honest and, um, you know, open. Hmm. That's a good guest. Some guest who is just whatever you want to throw at me, or some people are more private. Um, I'll be interviewing Tom Ellis from Lucifer, and um, great guy. I'm really excited about that one, but he could be a private private guy. I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So sometimes I don't know the guy or the or the. Or the oh, I'm what do you? What is well? I was going to say, what do you do in that situation? But like, what what? is your advice for me? Honestly, your questions were great and it was fun and it felt like a conversation. You didn't have any notes. You mm. just talked, you know, I think, um, do your, just, and I'm sure you do this, but with every guest, if you don't know them or if you would just breeze down their Wikipedia page and a couple other areas and just say, you know, okay, oh, he went, he, oh, he grew up in blah, blah, oh, yeah. he did this. Just, it's just in your head. It's just yeah. somewhere you could remember and go. 
Yeah. You can go. Just I have all that about you. No, you know about me. No, I mean, I did it. Like, yeah. I did my research. Like, yeah. I have it there. But I find that I I will not get to that stuff because I'm just talking. And by the way, that's great. And if you can just... Um, I think it, the more it sounds like just a conversation the two people are having anywhere, mm. that, like, if someone was a fly on the wall... They'd be like, yeah. oh, these guys are just having a con. The more, and that takes time. And you've already got that because you're very personable. Mm. But like, I wasn't that like great, you know, in the beginning. I would, I'd step over people. I would, you know, I'd go, uh, and they're like, some, some even said, some of my friends like, dude, fucking let me finish. And I was like, sorry, dude. You know, and I had to yeah. learn sort of the etiquette, learn the, you know, to control the excitement, learn to just really listen, listen. And, um, that's it, man. The rest is just like, is your guest. If you know, you're, you're as good as your guest a lot of times, yeah. but as long as you're honest and you're open and you're asking, you know, good questions, you're going to be great. Thank you. I'm hungry. I, um, yeah, Aren't well, we're going to have to go do yours at some point. Yeah. We're going to inside of you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop by Wendy's. I'm, I'm learning though. I'm learning. And that's one of the, you know, this show made me listen and receptive to my therapist when he diagnosed me as ADHD mm. because I actually saw it in the way that I communicated in the talking over people and the like getting so excited that I couldn't stop myself. And like, you know, the way that you and I talk at a coffee shop may not be the same way that we talk here yeah. because you have to be conscious of the person finishing, but you also have to be conscious of the audience that's listening. Right. And it's a very different way of communicating. Let's try something. Let's pretend we're in a coffee shop and we just said, we just decided to have lunch together. Okay. Let's see what would happen. Okay. All right. Just we'll do it a minute long. Here we go. All right. What's up? What's going on hey, with you? Hey, I'm good. How you are you? Great. Thank you so much. So do you. Uh, I you're, love you're these like are, are you new. wired on something? What yeah, you, coffee. Oh, uh, you're wired on coffee. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I'm just what have you been you. doing? Where have you been? Nothing. It's been great. I've been just, uh, you know, trying to do what I love and hanging out and loving on my dogs and stuff like that. You got your dog you at hungry? the the hungry. convention though, right? Here? I'm hungry. Jesus we Christ. should get some food. Yeah, we Did you still food. have the dog that you got? Didn't you adopt your dog? Yeah, it's um, Blanche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blanche yeah. and Trisha Helfer brought yeah. the dog home from the convention, right? Uh, uh, Jason Momoa and yeah, they brought Blanche home from Salt Lake after the con. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was all, yeah, I yeah that. absolutely. How's Robin? He's good. Yeah, He's good. So how's the sex? Um, You know, always good. Good. Always good. good. Thank good. God Mary, someone 10 years younger than you oh gosh you know i need to marry someone 10 years older than me so they slow (laughs) slow down i i don't have it in me all right see that was see it was good but it was you know it's it's the same really it's the same and we were kind of rapid fire and play we're playing it up but like you know our conversations would be normally the same we'd be goofing and saying the same shit yes so just have fun yeah but at the same i mean yes we would be goofing around and and having the the same shit but then how do you how do you then ask hard questions like how did you get mm, how did you get into the real no but like how did you get that conversation with Kiefer Sutherland about Julia Roberts how do you get that conversation how do you what how do you authentically talk about that well I really waited till the end and I threw in a lot of stuff like, you know, I have a dysfunctional family and grew up with this. And you guys get anxiety because I got fucking anxiety. And then we start to get to know each other and we start to chat and have some real candid conversations and some laughs. And I was like, I love your music. And I wish I did. And we played a little song. I go, I really love. And so I, I, I kind of like disarming. And then at the end, I go, guys, look, I just, I mean, you're in the same room with me. I just have to ask this. You can tell me to fuck off. I'll edit it out if you don't want me to. Completely just like, hey. But like, you know, the whole Julia Roberts thing. Like, you know, uh, how are you guys still friends after all that? And something like that. Yeah. And he's like, well, you know. Uh, and then they they answered it. Mm-hmm. And they could have been like, hey, he could have honestly made me really uncomfortable going, hey, I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not getting into that. We're not talking about that. And that yeah. would have been, all right, I'm sorry, I apologize. I just thought I'd ask. And it would have been really uncomfortable. Has so that sometimes happened, you, though? Um, no, but I've had somebody do this once. Like, you can't talk about that. 
Oh yeah. And I was like, okay, we'll cut that out. Fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. All right. Back. And you know, but most, most of the time, sometimes you just got to make people feel comfortable and feel like you can. Have, there's times where I go, I haven't made this person feel enough, you know, settled in and uh, comfortable enough to ask the question that I was thinking of asking. It doesn't make sense. It comes out of the blue. I'm not asking the question because I don't think it's the right time and I don't do it. I make that call. Yeah, I did that. I did that. We had an interview where I did that. I wanted to talk to someone about something and it wasn't the right time. Wasn't it the right wasn't time. the right, it was not the right time and it would have been disrespectful. Good to for do you. It. You could know that that's yeah. called, um, what's it called? Uh, instinct. Or social awareness. <laughs> social social awareness. Brought to you by. <laughs> Don't talk to Tommy about his, you know, dad's whatever. I don't know. I have no jokes. I have no jokes. I have no jokes. I have, good You're, jokes. I have no jokes and I know you're hungry and I know we have to go to your podcast because um, you didn't know you were doing my podcast when you agreed to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> I know. You know what happened? No, because I Hang reread on. the text messages, Michael, and it was very clear, right? To get you to come here, I said, hey, come do the podcast or do you, do you have time for the podcast? And you thought that I was asking to come to your podcast, which I would do your podcast anytime you want me to do right, your Right, but I've never done it in person. But I've, done, but I've done your podcast twice in person. Yeah, that's true. But uh, uh, my point is, is that I would never ask someone, hey, can I come on your podcast? But here's your text. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get real. Um, thanks for the fun laughs. Thanks for the fun last uh, night. <laughs> no, fun laughs, you pervert. <laughs> She says, um, it's fine. My point is, is that we have to leave here and be done with my podcast to go do your podcast. So you can get on a flight a, and go see a baby. Because we did a tit for tat. Yeah. You came here. Yeah. Gave me a tit and I'm going to come and I'm going to give you a tat. I like that. There you go. This there is a go. lot of fun. I really had fun on this. Good. You guys I'm glad. This I'm is great. Glad. And it looks great. It's going to be fun. It's you all a little that matters. Music. Have a little theme song. I could even write you a theme song. We have a theme song. You do? Yeah, if not, I feel like a song. It's like, she goes, blah, 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 Katie Sackoff. Blah, blah. I already, it's already catchy. I got it. Okay. Um, you guys, <laughs> this has been Blah, Blah, Blah uh, with Katie Sackoff with Michael Rosenbaum. Thank you for listening. Um, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, all that good shit. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. My, my, I'll come on your podcast whenever you want. Thank you. This and is I will really great. Go on uh, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Or go listen to it. Or go watch listen it. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Go listen to it. Like it. Listen here. You know, all that good Support stuff. each other. Support yeah. our podcasts. Support honesty and mental health. Amen. Bye. Bye.